Okay, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Paige Balabao, and I am a project manager with the Cheer and Champs team. First, I would like to welcome you all to the second webinar in our Champs COVID-19 Response Summer Series. Today, we will be sharing exciting innovations hospitals and community support structures have developed and implemented to better support mothers and infants during COVID-19. Before we begin, I just want to make a couple quick notes. First, if you can take a moment to look at the bottom left corner of your Zoom screen and make sure that you are muted, signified by the little microphone icon having a red slash through it, to ensure that we can hear the pre presentations clearly and there's no background noise. Second is that presentations for today's webinar have been pre-recorded and will be shown consecutively, one directly after the other. So if you have any questions, please be sure to jot them down or use the chat box in the Zoom meeting to submit questions at any time. And we'll be sure to answer them after both presentations have finished. And lastly, this webinar will be recorded and posted on our website in the next couple of days. I also just want to take a moment to thank Maytal so much for setting all this up. She's done such an amazing job of um, coordinating all these webinars throughout this series. So thank you, Maytal. Um, we can go to the first slide. This is just a reminder to be sure to check out our website for our upcoming webinars. Um, this will be the last in the current series and we'll be making updates shortly on when our next uh, webinar will be coming out. Um, but you can go to our website and watch the recordings of any previous webinars in case you miss them or if you would like to watch them again. Next slide, please. We have also been working on some exciting new developments, such as our cheer newsletter and our champs Q&A. So again, you can feel free to leave your email in the chat box, reach out to any of us, or go to our website for more information. Next slide. And before we begin the presentation, the champs team would also like to thank everyone working tirelessly to adapt to the evolving pandemic and how it impacts maternity care and give a special thank you for those of you who have shared video segments for this presentation. So without further ado, we will begin the presentation. Hi guys, I have a feeling that my link is not very good. So um, if you can't hear me, um, <laughs> I'm not sure what you're gonna do. I, anyway, I just wanted to um, present um, this um, as a sort of introduction to the webinar. Um, this is um, an article that was published in Vogue magazine, which as you know, is a popular magazine this week. Um, and it's about how some of the measures that are coming out right now and some of the adaptations um, are made for, co are really going to help the way that breastfeeding um, women at home um, can breastfeed their babies without having to deal with perhaps so many um, scheduled meetings, having to drive to work, having to drive, get daycare, that the flexibility that's being allowed by many of these options around our working state um, would actually help with um, breastfeeding women. And I just thought it was a very interesting case that it was in Vogue magazine um, and that it's on the sort of almost literally the front pages in a very positive light. And I think it just sums up for me how one of the things I'm hoping that comes out of this terrible situation with COVID is that we are able to make adaptations in many things. As we all know, it's already you know, better for the environment at large um, to reduce the amount of mass transportation and all that kind of thing that has had to happen with COVID. And potentially, you know, if companies don't realise they don't need people in the office all day, every day, they can cut down on commuting times, we can cut down on office space. That's just one of the many um, one example of the many um, but this is a good read and I think it's just sort of telling that it's in the um, popular press at the moment um, in Vogue magazine and I thought it was a good kickoff point for the rest of the webinar so um, we are going to hear now from a lot of different people who've been making positive changes um, and or taking advantage of the situation that they find themselves in to change things for the better and considering maybe whether some of these things can be um, longer term things. So that is my little intro there. And now I will hand it back to my team who are going to put up the videos. Jack Maypole explains changes and innovations at Boston Medical Center during COVID-19, including the daily pediatrics COVID brief he has been sending out every day since the beginning of March. I mean, perhaps where was the inspiration to communicating to the department or even responding um, personally to the COVID surge, like um, a lot of people in the department? And I, and I'll, I'll 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 wade right in with my answer. You know, I think 
I think if you were to turn back the clock and to try to crawl into the heads of people in pediatrics here at Boston Medical Center back in March, we were all kind of freaked out. You know, there was this big, giant, dark wave coming at us, and it was ill-defined, and it was terrifying, and the stories kept topping each other in terms of how scary it was. And people were saying things that sounded, you know, maybe informed or maybe speculative, and it all fed into this really interesting situation I've never seen before, and I really wouldn't, frankly, mind if I never saw again in some respects. And that was, you know, massive uncertainty and this idea that we were going to be challenged in a way that we had never been challenged before. And we had, this is, you know, coming from a hospital where we had survived the marathon bombing and we had been through other natural disasters of lesser scale, but this was really sort of a new order. So it really required all of us to be thinking on an entirely different level. And I am, you know, but one member of a large symphony playing along and I felt um, for my role, part of it was to find ways where I could step up and contribute meaningfully, uh, not get in anyone's way, but perhaps try to be like my peers and inspired by my peers to you know, really go outside of my comfort zone or to do something hopefully important and hopefully that was contributing in a smaller or bigger way, whatever was possible. And um, I can't say it enough, that happened a million times over. There were pulmonologists taking care of adult COVID patients. There were people who were general pediatric primary care docs doing that also. There were people like me and others um, who stepped into the um, palliative care program that was developed in the emergency room to help with the communication gaps for families and sick relatives who maybe were admitted from rest homes who needed end-of-life directives or um, healthcare proxy sort of support. Uh, and they're just offering some help to both our ER colleagues, but also to the patients, and then sometimes to their extended family by the phone. So, you know, really, no one would have imagined or even had that conversation back in January, but by really St. Patrick's Day leading into, you know, certainly by Easter, you know, we were already, you know, moving into the new house that we had built for ourselves, and we're doing all sorts of different roles. So that was kind of like the that's how it really changed our landscape. Like we did not know, and even when the surge was hitting us long about mid-April, um, the surge being the absolute peak of COVID with cases coming, new cases coming in every day, and sadly lots of deaths occurring across our state. You know, I think people still were saying like, how can you use me, you know, put me to work, I'd like to do more. And there were equal numbers of people behind the lines and sort of behind the scenes, the unsung heroes who were launching and standing up our telehealth practice and making sure patients were getting connected. And other things happened too. Like we realized there were kids not getting vaccines. And so we started what we call our mobile neighborhood unit where we uh, had a doctor and nurse teams go out into the, into the communities of Boston and give immunizations to kids who were falling behind, piggybacking resources like diapers and gift cards for groceries or for Target for families who maybe were running short on finances as the pandemic went along. So all of that was in play too. And you know, at, you learn something when you work at a m large academic medical center over a couple of decades, and that is, it's a really big place. And it's very easy even for a big medical center, let alone a larger department, for all the people not to know what all the people are doing. And I sort of felt part of my role could be stepping in and being the guy who sort of tries to keep people connected. And so for better, or for worse, for rightly or wrongly, um, part of what I've done is to try to bring back in the vast place where there are thousands, of, <clears throat> excuse me, where there are thousands of employees, it was to kind of bring folks together with um, maybe a conversation that was, you know, maybe not unlike the radio and the depression or, on, uh, maybe not different from a blog that everyone's kind of tuned into. Uh, no intention to be the water cooler conversation of the uh, next day, so there are water coolers anymore, or offices to go to, but, but more that there was a, a sense of togetherness and a sense of sharing the, the experience. And so um, I've tried to do that in a daily uh, newsletter to the department. So. Um, call it what you will, you know, like a kind of like a letters home or letters from my corner of of the pandemic. But, you know, reflecting on things I hope are shared experiences, um, shared challenges, shared emotions, 
shared moments. Uh, other times, just trying to share or foster uh, conversation. Uh, and it's been a delight at how people have taken to it. Um, we've had a variety of, of um, threads during the last few weeks, or I should say the last couple of months, of people doing stuff like sharing music videos of themselves, um, making music, dancing the music, of um, some combination of those things, uh, including TikToks. Yeah, very 2020, right? Um, and we've also had um, folks putting forth um, art that they've done, so drawings and poetry, some of it hilarious, some of it quite poignant, all of it just incredible, really personal. So. Um, I've tried to offer a little hodgepodge of resources so a very distracted and overloaded person whose email box is exploding every day, I can give them just kind of like the clipping service of things that are relevant to coronavirus, things might be relative, relevant rather to the political and social and health policy situation here in Massachusetts and Boston, and then things that I think are just common to all of us as human beings. And so that's where like cartooning, something that I do um, is a way to share that as well. Some of it's also me just working through my issues. So uh, there's a little bit of selfishness baked into that. But you know, hopefully it's something that adds to um, our shared journey together uh, and is uh, you know, in, in, in its own way and in, in these daily installments, you know, probably will make something of a story we can look back on, maybe laugh about, maybe try to forget. Um, but certainly acknowledge that it really has been uh, an incredible time the last three to four months. Um, do I have a favorite one? I, I think the ones I enjoy the most are the ones that surprise me. Like I'll put out every given day, I'll put out maybe three to five cartoons on Twitter or social media, and some of those go into the newsletter. Regardless of where they go, I always enjoy most that things are things that people respond to the most. Um, it's best when it's a bit of a surprise. I might do it quickly, a little slapdash cartoon, and then people um, really warm up to it. That always is a stunner. And there might be another one I pour a lot of thought and time in, and maybe I'm a little in love with it, only to find that no one else finds it interesting. So that's always important and humbling as someone who's trying to get it right, and it's uh, yeah, and you're never done. Um, I think the moments or pieces I've, I've enjoyed or have felt most satisfied by are um, the poem I did, uh, or kind of the re-rendering, I should say, of Goodnight Moon into Goodnight Hospital. That was um, the night, I think, that actually Massachusetts was peaking, so it was poignant in that way, or very memorable. Um, in terms of the cartoons, um, there are different ones I like for different reasons. I think the ones, the series on Shakespeare was one of my favorites that just was kind of fun. Um, the Newbie Journal Club was also kind of a, a, a hoot. And then um, some of just the images of like drawing the planet Earth with a surgical mask on uh, as a plea that people join in um, was one that I, I think stuck with me a little more than the others. Tracy Capaletti describes modifications made to support parents in their church community during COVID. And Kathy Carruthers explains innovations being made all over the United States to help support new mothers in these challenging circumstances. Hello, I'm Kathy Carruthers and I live near the beautiful Mississippi Gulf Coast. As this COVID-19 pandemic has surged, many groups are using virtual tools such as Facebook live stream, Zoom and other methods to help build and maintain connection with their constituents. I'd like to introduce you to Tracy Capaletti of Gulfport First United Methodist Church she tells how they maintain connection with new parents in their congregation. Hi, my name is Tracy Cavaletti. I am the Director of Discipleship at First United Methodist Church of Gulfport, Mississippi. And I wanted to talk to you today about some of the resources that we have been providing parents during this time of pandemic. You know, when this all started, we thought that this was, you know, a two or three week crisis that kids would only be home for a couple weeks and we just had to get through that. So we offered um, activities and resources for parents to keep their kids engaged during that time. And then we also realized that we had a lot of newborns being born within our congregation 
uh, right at the beginning of this pandemic as well. So Kathy Carruthers and I uh, got together, well, virtually got together and did a interview about what it means to have a newborn during a pandemic and the risks and benefits of breastfeeding during this time, as well as other community resources that are available to parents of newborns and small children. And so we really, what we really wanted to provide to parents was resources, yes, but we also wanted them to know that we are with them through this. We are here for them, for their questions, for their support. The church is the heart of the community in Mississippi. Tracy's weekly time with parents is just one part of this church's robust array of weekly online offerings, mental health moments with an MD psychiatrist, Bible studies, devotionals, church services, joyful music celebrations, conversations about race, and even prayers from the porch. The WIC program continues to serve new families during this pandemic. In North Carolina, Zoom connects new peer counselor hires for training. They can even learn about breast anatomy with fun activities and split into breakout sessions for smaller group conversations. In Vermont, a Microsoft virtual platform connects prenatal and breastfeeding parents for breastfeeding education and even a back to work class. They find that attendance is high and new parents actually prefer online education. In some states such as Texas and Colorado, moms can meet with a lactation consultant through video conferencing on their phone or tablet. The platform is secure and HIPAA compliant. And despite the fact that conferences and other large gatherings no longer occur, it doesn't mean that professional education is on hold. Most conferences have converted to virtual events. Both ILCA and the National WIC Association are holding virtual breastfeeding conferences in August and September, and it's not too late to register. Recently, I provided a virtual session at the National Healthy Start Conference. The title of the presentation was Supporting Breastfeeding During the COVID-19 Pandemic. You know, we are all learning how to adapt to physical distancing, but we need to remember that we are far from social distancing. Connection is even more important now than ever before. And the options are endless if you put your creative hat on and be willing to think outside the box. Tawanda Logan Hurt will now tell us about changes WIC has made to their support for new moms in Mississippi during the COVID pandemic. Hello everyone. My name is Tawanda Logan Hurt. I'm one of the WIC Regional Breastfeeding Coordinators with the Mississippi State Department of Health. And today I will be sharing with you some changes we've made during this COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic has really made a great impact on the way that we provide service to our clients. We are not able to make uh, many face-to-face -face contacts because of you know, protecting ourselves and making sure that we protect our community as well. So we made some arrangements with um, getting permission through our uh, funding source to provide remote services. So a lot of our work is being done by phone. We are, our staff are able to provide nutrition education and we are allowed to do that by phone if the client agrees to have it done. Uh, we, we're not totally restricting clients from coming into the clinic, but we give them that option and a lot of them have been pleased with being able to have that as an option and have been, you know, um, choosing it. So uh, another way is we're um, planning on working on getting to be able to do group classes, but uh, I also I'm a co-facilitator with our with a couple of baby cafes in our area, and our baby cafes have um, moved to doing um, Zoom meetings, and they sent out the announcements um, beforehand with the, the um, password and um, registration link, and 
all the client has to do is just sign up that day and they're able to be entered um accepted into the um, zoom meeting so we've had a great response from it um people are really fond of being able to get the information in the comfort of their own homes without having to come out and um, be exposed and have a chance that you know uh, coming in contact with someone that um, is suspected or that you know has the the um, virus so we've had great success with our turnouts as well we are really wanting more of the community agencies to spread the word so we can um, get the information out to the clients um, like we usually are because we have some very valuable information that you know we still desire to share to the clients so we we have to still work together as a team to meet the needs of the clients the best way we can um, we also have changed the way that we issue devices mainly our multi-user pumps those are the ones that we loan to clients right now due to uh, not having or not you know knowing if the um, cleaning resources that we have are able to really disinfect um, appropriately we have moved to just uh, issuing clients the pumps that don't, do not have to be returned, the double electric pumps that do not have to be returned. Um, we still evaluate them and see, you know, what's the best product for them. If they could use hand expressing um, to uh, express their milk or um, manual pump, or if they do have a need for an electric pump, there's still an assessment um, that has to be done. So, you know, we, we're protecting our, you know, clients that we are continuing to get by not issuing them a pump that um, has been exposed with the virus. So that, that's why we are, we've discontinued giving out those multi-user pumps at the time. So this is um, ways that we have, you know, worked with changing our work performance so we can still meet the needs of the clients. So, um, you know, every day can be, you know, a different challenge, but we're all working together and doing the best we can to get things done and still, um, you know, make sure that we are meeting our work performance. All right, I, I'm glad to have this opportunity to share this information with you all today. And I hope that everyone just stays safe um, and well during this, you know, trying time. Thank you. Bye-bye. Angela Ferguson Parker at Southwest Mississippi Regional Medical Center will describe the changes they had to make during COVID and how these changes helped lead to increased rooming in rates. My name is Angela. I am the COC at Southwest Mississippi Regional Medical Center. Our facility was designated on December the 12th, 2019, and we were three months into post-designation when the novid COVID-19 took on its seriousness here. My reaction was no. How we adapted to COVID-19 and how that resulted in increased rates of rooming in. Anything that could be found out about this virus, I'm sure all of you can relate, you know, whether it was was, was paramount at this time, you know, whether we were looking, you know, for information on through AP, um, World Health Organization, Centers of Disease Control, CNN, wherever. Um, we wanted to know, you know, what is it? Where did it come from? How did it get here? Why is it here? Um, all of the what ifs. How do I protect myself? How do I protect my family? How will it or will it affect breastfeeding, our present skin to skin and rooming in practices? Um, <clears throat> so as we became more aware, the question was, how do we reach out to the community? And of course, our hospital, our unit, um, both of the affiliated clinics operate a social media site, Facebook, um, Instagram, you know, so forth, et cetera. Um, what we did was first to reach out to the community was relating the facts, you know, um, a restricted visitation policy for our unit was developed. It was posted, it was printed, and then it was distributed. Um, it, de it detailed patients 
triage patient, excuse me, could only have one visitor, woman that was given birth could only have one caregiver to remain with her throughout her entire stay, baby or babies that were in the nursery or a NICU, had only one visitor, preferably the mother. Um, alternative communication methods were and are encouraged and welcome. Moms were made aware that their support person <clears throat> will be screened. Um, as well as themselves upon arrival into any of the facility entrances. They would have a temp check, they would be questioned, um, masks was required, hand sanitizing, and so on. Um, hotlines were also set up by the administration for the community for any questions or concerns. And at the bottom, you can actually see my little ruminant chart. Um, our ruminant rates have always been about 80% or better. And we have in the past had some hiccups and still do since we are not yet reaching 100%. Our less than 100% are usually due to charting errors or sometimes a lack thereof in some cases. Um, very rare do we just have babies hanging out in the nursery for non-medical reasons. We still do our hearing screens, our PKU, our post lock screening, security photos in the nursery, and babies are, um, are only usually brought out, you know, one time for security photos and one time for maybe other routine things. Our baby boys, of course, are brought into the nursery for circumcisions. And all else, pediatric assessments, bath, are all done in the room. And the staff is well aware of limited exposure outside of the mother's room, especially during this time. Our intervention, um, extreme safety, things we've always done, mask and delivery procedures, gloves, gowns, consistently good hygiene um, practices were all an essential practice. Um, now it's mask all the time, increased good um, hygiene practices, no touching face, wiping down areas more frequently is, is really important at this point. And due to all the changes with COVID-19, one can only imagine the feelings or the anxiety of a new mother um, to be. I think that outside of extreme safety precautions, we do still connect with our new families, taking the time to listen and address all their concerns and worries and questions, offer a tissue for the tears if necessary, and provide endless motivation and encouragement. Educating these families on what's happening, what's too happening, and providing at least, <clears throat> at best, a stress-free. And how do we come up with these new ideas? Well, mothers were asking questions. Several things happened on a whim during this time. One day, a father walked down to the cafeteria and was told by the cafeteria staff visitors were not allowed in the cafeteria and he could not be served. Um, our nurse manager got the wind of this and made a request to the dietary department. And after that, all of our guests were served three meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and administration actually purchased and set up a very nice drink and snack machines on all of the units in the hospital. Um, we began to discharge batch deliveries within 24 hours and some repeat C-sections, but most C-sections remain until 48 hours. All babies are scheduled an appointment with pediatricians before discharge to be seen within 48 hours. All of our breastfeeding mommies are called within 48 hours by myself. Um, and then of course, for, fo for basically follow up and support on their breastfeeding um, experiences and what's going on at the moment. Um, at the top left, you will notice where there's like a little binder, a little pink and black and white. Um, these were all constructed and were sent out to all of our um, affiliated, to our affiliated clinics. And so these binders are actually in all of the, um, the, the patient's rooms or where the patients will be seen in the particular clinics. Um, the binders are used by the healthcare providers and of course their nursing staff to discuss breastfeeding required information from the first visit to the last. Um, because we felt that, you know, the mothers needed to know, you know, what to expect and if they had questions about breastfeeding during this new 
far as our COVID-19 during this particular pandemic, you know, how important breastfeeding still was, you know, how it was important to her um, and whether or not she could still continue to breastfeed, you know, during this particular time. And so we constructed a, a sheet and, and gathered as much information as we could um, in concentration to actually put in the breastfeeding during the COVID-19 pandemic. And it tends to cover all of that information. And not only that, we also um, designed two other forms, one entitled Temporary Restrictions and Visitor Guidance During the COVID-19 Pandemic for Whale Obstetrical Patients. And the other one is Recommendations and Restrictions um, and Visitor Guidance for Patients Who Are COVID-19 Positive and Are Persons Under Investigation. On the bottom, you will see like a visitor checklist. And then of course, our unit um, revised visitation policy as well. Our prenatal breastfeeding um, group classes changed from the second to fourth Wednesdays, or for now, we're actually doing um, the prenatal breastfeeding class one-on-one -on -one, um, every single Wednesday. And there's two slots, a 10 o'clock slot and a one o'clock slot. So these mothers will also get this information firsthand from me directly and whatever questions that they may have in regarding that, um, the COVID-19 um, breastfeeding, skin to skin, what to expect, visitations, what to bring to the hospital, and things like that, whatever questions that they may have along that. And then we go into, you know, hands on latching and um, hand expression and um, positioning and the importance of breastfeeding, skin to skin, rooming in, and all of that is actually included in the class during this particular time, as well as the mothers are still able to get um, a tour. Another change is that we do not presently have manual breast pumps, but we do now. Um, all moms are taught hand expression during the hospital stay, but if for some reason a mother that um, is positive COVID or a PUI patient chooses to provide breast milk for a baby, but, will, but cannot or chooses not to directly breastfeed, then she can choose to hand express and a manual breast pump can be provided for her in order to stimulate the breast even more. We're definitely encouraging breastfeeding during this time and we are supporting mothers to do so. Baby Friendly um, recently shared some information a while back on supporting formula feeding mothers as well during this time. And we do have mothers that choose not to formula feed or those that choose to transition from breast to formula. So we did begin to provide mothers with a little extra formula um, initially, but we have not this month thus far. Um, most moms are on WIC. Some of our moms are actually on WIC and their appointments are usually between two to three days rather than two to three weeks. So we haven't had any issues with having to give a whole lot of formula to moms that choose not to um, breastfeed their babies or, or that choose to formula feed. What we did to make this work. We listened to and consulted with the other nursing staff, um, and of course, we have a great nurse. We have a great nurse manager, um, Kim, and I, I met with her for approval on some of these changes that we made directly on our unit in regards to the classes and, um, you know, breastfeeding outreach and things like that. And she either just told me to tell her what I needed or put it together, <laughs> and the work began. Do we have plans to expand or continue limited visitation if relevant? Hopefully, yes, um, it's working. Limited visitors, especially during at med labor, um, you know, limiting vis visitors and visitation during the first couple of hours after delivery, setting up time slots to allow patient, you know, privacy during feeding times and you know for needed rest and end in visitation after you know certain hours of the night um, it is, is really working so hopefully yes we hope to expand our continued limited visitation you know if and when this COVID-19 is over. Jackie Lambert, the lead facilitator for the Delta Baby Cafe in Indianola, Mississippi, shared with us a news story by the Delta News that featured the virtual baby cafe she and her team launched during COVID. 
Hi, this is Maytal. It seems like that link is taking a long time to load, so we'll just continue with the webinar, but we will put the link for this. It's here, and we'll put it in the chat as well if you want to check out that short clip. It's really wonderful. Thank you for Delta News for covering it for the Indianola Baby Cafe for your work. Dominique Belgard will now describe the virtual support innovations she made in her Mother Healing Group, a group she facilitates to guide and help new mothers in the Boston area. Hello, hello. Welcome to Mother Healing. I'm so happy you're here. So as you see up here, um, this is kind of part of Mother Healing. That's a group I run on Tuesdays um, from 11 to 1. And we focus on supporting moms through mostly I, the ones I serve are breastfeeding moms, but also just moms who need support. And um, one thing we really focus on is the vibration of music so that we heal together. Okay, I normally say, welcome to other healing. We talk about the shared agreements. Normally people would be eating. And then I'd be like, what's going on with you? How are you doing? So it, it's all about them. And I just end it with um, celebrating them, like a constant positive, positive encouragement, positive empowerment for the whole thing. So they know that, you know, I'm here, there's no judgment and you're in a safe place and I'm gonna listen. I'm just gonna listen. And then I pinpoint all the positive. You'll get all the negative and I'll pinpoint the positive because when you leave me, I need you to feel empowered. I need to impact you with love, kindness, and healing through the drums, the drum vibration. Just make, you know, just remind that music is power to our body and we need it. And why not have your own song through the vibrations of drumming, clapping, vocal, whatever you bring to the table. And then that's pretty much it. And then they would shower their babies with um, words of encouragement, words of healing. So th there's this whole thing. We don't know what um, journey has our mothers have taken to be here. And focus on when it's the right time, people will come into this circle and they will feel healed. They will feel loved. Like they will, they will just change the way they're feeling, you know? So that's the impact. We normally do a group. Sometimes it's one person, sometimes it's, it's 10. And we serve all of them. And, and you know, that's how it was when we did it in person. And then during COVID, if there's a person who's like, hey, someone needs some healing right now and I know she's up, so be it. I would do that because I know what I'm doing. I know what how it'll impact them. So it felt good doing one on one, but it's beautiful when you have a group because it's it's a village. It's a village. Because you need others to see that you're not the only one suffering, but you actually have a village who supports you, even if they don't know you. At that moment, you feel loved. You feel showered. I mean, you you feel amazing. <laughs> you know, and you know, everyone goes through their challenges. You don't know what it is. But you want to know that while they're in the group, they feel loved. They feel wanted so that they continue going or when they need that healing, like, let me tap in the mother healing. <laughs> and then when they get there, like, oh, I didn't realize I needed this. This was great. Wow. So and then you pass it on and that's how it goes. <laughs> We will now move outside the United States to Greece to hear from Mariam Tuma, who will describe the adaptations she and the cheering team made to provide virtual support to refugee mothers during the pandemic. My name is Mariam Tuma and I'm a team member of the Center for Health Equity, Education and Research in Greece, where we focus on service provision for refugee women in different forms of accommodation throughout the Attica region. Um, these services were provided on a regular basis through in-person consultations provided at these accommodation structures. However, obviously, um, this changed quite dramatically during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which resulted in the closure of camp access and a full lockdown placed on the entirety of Greece. Um, this forced us to change our strategy. We obviously didn't want to spend this time idle. We are a public health organization and it was quite necessary to continue our services throughout the lockdown. Therefore, we transitioned to an online telehealth model uh, where we uploaded original evidence-based resources on key issues such as infant feeding in emergency situations and COVID-19 transmission. Um, we realized that in order for these resources to actually be useful, we needed to distribute them amongst the target population directly. Um, obviously with our camp access being cut off, um, we had to brainstorm new ways of doing this and finally concluded to um, the method of social media. 
Um, it is well documented that refugees and asylum seekers use social media as a means of info sharing and um, as support networks in a way. Um, this is the way they keep in touch with friends and family back home or in their target destination. Um, they also use these groups to ask questions about the different services that are provided in the location that they are based in and um, the different restrictions currently uh, with the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Um, so there are a range of different Facebook groups dedicated to different aspects of migration in Greece. We just had to find them um, and we did. So we decided to use these channels to distribute the resources uh, of on different dimensions of infant feeding in emergency situations uh, and public health promotion. In order to make these work, we had to use the, the languages of the beneficiaries um, and join these groups and gain access. Uh, we also had to gain the trust of the people in the group by giving a little bit of background of who we are, what we do and why we're posting what we're posting. Um, we also had to try and make the information as engaging as possible. Obviously, these channels were being flooded at the time with information on COVID-19. Um, some of it accurate, some of it inaccurate. And in order to ensure that our resources were kind of um, taken seriously, we had to provide a little bit of um, a little bit of uh, kind of trust building uh, information. Um, so we ended up getting quite good feedback from beneficiaries um, through their engagement with the, the material that we were posting. So we got some questions, some comments, um, and we also monitored the views of our material, which spiked every time we posted um, on these groups. Um, so with the restrictions still imposed in camps, we're hoping to expand this model and use it to reach out to those who need the services we are currently providing. Um, of course, the landscape is constantly changing and generally unstable, and we need to be flexible about this and also be sensitive to these Facebook groups and not take them over. Um, this is maybe a safe space for some beneficiaries to share some information or get um, ask for some information or services. Um, and we need to respect that. Um, so there's also this kind of um, ethics issue involved. Um, and just being completely honest, when you join the group, sometimes they ask these questions at the beginning when you join a group and they ask what your purpose of joining the group is. It's really important to be completely honest and explicit that, okay, I'm a service provider and um, I would like to post some resources which may be of use on the group so that people don't think maybe you are um, also here for the same reason that they are. Uh, there is a power structure involved, so you need to be very, very honest and uh, aware of that when posting in Facebook groups um, that your beneficiaries might use. Um, there's also this issue of data protection, of course, like to collect any information of the people in the group um, is uh, unethical so you have to be obviously careful about that in case someone asks questions and that kind of thing but yeah i think overall this was a very successful innovative way of um, sharing information it's really important to kind of modernize information sharing and kind of flow with the times although it might be hard to learn at first it is a steep learning curve but we have to be creative and innovative in our ways of um, adaptation to different circumstances that we are now facing, especially with the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and yeah, so thank you for listening. Also from the cheering team, Pirette Impose Biala will explain how her critical on the ground support for mothers in a shelter in Athens, Greece evolved during COVID-19. Bonjour, je suis Madame Guéret, originaire du Congo Kishasa. Je vis à la résidence Elena Maternité. Entre stress, colère et peur, enfermée dans un immeuble dont les entrées et les sorties sont interdites, à chaque réunion de la semaine, on nous rappelait les règles l'hygiène et les dissociations sociales. Nous devons laver les mains chaque fois avec les savons et les hydroalcooliques. On avait le droit de sortir qu'une seule fois dans la semaine parce que c'était le début du confinement. 
le 23 mars, le début du confinement ici en Grèce, on avait le droit de sortir qu'une seule fois dans la semaine. Et quand vous devez sortir, vous devez dorénavant envoyer les messages pour répondre aux lois du gouvernement. Et quand vous sortez, vous allez faire pas, vous allez passer qu'une heure, pas plus d'une heure à l'extérieur. Cela a causé une crise auprès de certaines mamans par manque de rations, par manque de soutien des ONG, des aliments, par manque de natation, tant de choses. Parce qu'on n'avait pas le temps, on n'avait pas les moyens de sortir. Cela a amené, comme je vous ai dit, le colère, le stress. Les mamans sont devenues stressées. Les mamans ne savaient plus allaiter convenablement leurs enfants. Parce qu'ils étaient là stressés, ils ne savaient pas quoi faire. Regarde, je vais vous dire, une maman qui n'a jamais donné, jamais donné une formule, une dame. Je viens, je la trouve, elle est en train de, de faire de former, il prenait de l'eau des robinets, non, oui, et les biberons non stérilisés. Il voulait donner à son enfant parce que c'était déjà, elle, a, elle avait déjà fini de former à son bébé. C'est grâce au confinement. Le confinement l'a poussé à donner une formule à son bébé. Je l'ai aidé, je l'ai appelé la dame, quand je viens de vous dire là, je l'ai appelé la dame et je l'ai aidé, on a préparé ensemble. À cas de malaise, le fièvre manifestait les femmes enceintes, les mamans, les enfants et leurs bébés, j'étais là présent grâce à des formations que j'ai eues conseil que j'ai au Tchéling, j'ai pu gérer une autre petite clinique mensuelle. Et on avait chaque mercredi, les après-midi, les mamans venaient, parce que c'est chaque mercredi, les après-midi que nous avons notre pésé, et les mamans venaient. Et les mamans qui ne venaient pas, ils commencent à venir. Il dit, posez tant de questions parce que j'étais inquiet, stressé. Les femmes enceintes disaient, je suis enceinte. Que, devenir mes, que vont devenir mon enfant? Si j'ai je, si je, le COVID-19, mon enfant, lui aussi sera contaminé. Les mamans qui allaitent, les mamans, j'allaite mon bébé. Et si j'ai le COVID, mon enfant sera aussi contaminé, sera-t-elle contaminée? Il y avait tant de questions. Et si j'attrape aujourd'hui le COVID, je vais mourir, mon enfant aussi. Je dirais, grâce à mon équipe, parce qu'on avait des réunions chaque semaine, De, de réunions vidéo, on s'est parlé, on m'a donné des conseils grâce au chilling, nous sommes sortis sains. Je dirais grâce au chilling que nous sommes sortis sains parce qu'ils m'ont formé, ils m'ont aidé à des conseils. Je peux gérer notre clinique, moi seul. Je dirais, jusqu'ici, à Elena Maternité, on n'a eu aucune épidémie. Comme je vous ai dit, c'est grâce à Tilly que à Elena Maternité, nous sommes sortis sains. Merci.
Hi, everybody. Thanks um, for that. Um, thanks for compiling all those metal. It was no small feat, I have to say, to put all that together. Um, and I just, does anyone have any questions? I know that we are close to the hour, but the team can stay on longer if necessary. Um, thank you, Teresa, for your comments and for your um, engagement. I can see your face and you were very engaged there. Um, Laurie, um, you had said, you, Laurie Winter put a question into the um, chat box that there are a lot of examples of community-based support systems and if I'm wondering if anyone identified medical or psychiatric concerns and if so, how do you collaborate and communicate with physicians with maternal or pediatric care that may need to be involved with complex issues? Anybody got any um, thoughts on that one? Anybody? I mean, I, I'm sure it is quite challenging. I don't, Laurie, you're you're in in a clinical situation yourself. It's quite challenging to um, do the referrals. You know, to, to, to I mean, you can do so much remotely, but then it's difficult to sort of bring in the whole team approach, right? I was going to say, I'm always at the end of the phone call when you call me from Greece. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you were talking about Greece. You were talking about no. the Greek stuff. <laughs> yeah, I know. So I do. And that's very, that's very, um, I, I would say if that question specifically was regarding the working tree story, I mean, frankly. No, no, it wasn't. Well, it, it was really meant for, you know, really anywhere where um, inevitably there's going to be complex medical problems that do arise. And really, because of these trusted relationships, you know, everything that we've heard about might give a window into worlds that the clinician doesn't ever get to see, you know, because patients aren't coming in at all in some cases. During yeah, COVID. and I would imagine if it happens at the baby cafes and all the things yeah. like that. I mean, in terms of Greece, the situation is so severe with the refugees that that there is not access there isn't access period i mean there's not access to anything like that except for some you know some cases where people can go to a psych hospital because there's a real breakdown and you know because greece has public health for everybody's free care they get most of the time they get a, a consult but really there's no there's no infrastructure to support anything among the among the refugees and they end up just getting sent home anyway so that kind, I mean, really, the work that we're doing there is just to make sure that physically the babies are growing and healthy and not get some terrible thing. And we do have to screen out physical stuff. You know, we train our peer counselors to make sure that if the baby comes in with something that looks very, or that, that they don't recognize that they refer them to a doctor for it. But in terms of psych stuff, we don't have a lot. Um, Anybody else want to address that? How they in the community setting perhaps or the, or the virtual setting address something that they pick up that might be more complex? Well, obviously a, a major question that we haven't got an answer to here. <laughs> um, and I think um, actually we'll, we'll, we'll um, has anyone got any other questions about anything or that they wanted to type into the chat? Okay, well, thank you then to all our wonderful presenters. I'm sorry one or two of the videos didn't play well. I know Jackie's on the line, but I think we'll um, simply post the link. And one other thing that we're going to do both this week's video and last week's video um, webinar is that we are going to break some of these presentations down into short segments because we know that, you know, for example, an agency that works with refugees may be really interested in what Perrette was talking about and a major academic medical centre may be really interested in what Jack was talking about and everything in between. So um, we, we're going to make them to short things, short videos for busy people and the same for the stories from last week from the moms. So please watch our social media channels. We have a YouTube channel as well with cheering and cheer um, and we actually only need a few more subscribers before we can customise it. We need 14 more people to get 100 subscribers. You don't have to pay, you just have to sign up. Um, and all these places where we we'll post our links, we will be posting some short ones um, that, you know, hopefully maybe some of you can use or, or link people to if you need stories from the epidemic, because um, please credit Oz and the speakers, but they are going to be out there in the public domain. All right. Well, thank you all. Thanks, Paige, for presenting. Thanks, Maytel, for putting it together. And thank you to all our wonderful um, people who donated their time and energy to um, speaking on the webinar. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.